I'm Richard Heathen, and this is Liberty Machine News on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Tonight, we will cover the Alberta government kidnapping and killing, essentially, foster children. The failure of state-forced CPS or Child Protective Services uh, and how it results in the deaths of hundreds of children. We will also cover how the U.S. government is literally funding radical Islamic extremists and how they are now using in their own their own foreign policy magazines they are calling or fearing an attack by the same radicals that they funded. I will also do an update of a story last week on ha- on the U.S. border crisis and how the U.N. is starting to involve itself. This is Liberty Machine News on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Alright, our first story. The United States government is actually funding the ISIS terrorists. Now, I seen an article out of the for- out of foreign policy. Now, foreign policy is the mouthpiece for the Council of Foreign Relations. It is the it is the magazine published by the globalist elite think tank uh, co- known as the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, what is ISIS? ISIS is an acronym which stands for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, which is an Islamist group formed by members of Al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Syrian rebels. Now, if you recall when the war in Syria started, and Islam- the U.S. government was, specifically John McCain, was getting involved in promoting the war and trying to get the U.S. government and build up public support for the Syrian rebels. Now, what's interesting is ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was trained by Israeli intelligence, the Mossad, with help from the United States and United Kingdom intelligence agencies, according to leaked documents from Edward Snowden. This was reported by the inter, uh, by the International Business Times. The U.S., Turkey, and Jordan were running train a training base for the Syrian rebels out of this Jordanian town of Safawi, the countries which is in the country's northern desert region. This was reported by World Net Daily. Thousands of the Syrian rebels were were trained in Safawi, in this training camp, training base. Now, the White House last month announced plans to provide members of the Syrian opposition with $500 million worth of weapons, equipment, and training. Now, think about this. We're the United the government, Obama, the US government, is still wanting to provide five hundred million dollars in support of the Syrian rebels, even though large chunks of the Syrian rebels are have gone into this area in Iraq and gone in who are part of ISIS. Now, ISIS controls large swaths of Iraq and Syria, but I Obama is still supporting them. You know, this is just, this is total, total problem reaction solution. They're just, they're creating this problem which allows them to expand their foreign policy, to expand their tentacles, to expand their reach across the globe. But they're funding, they're funding the same problem. As I go into later, they're, 
funding these people. They funded them. John McCain took pictures with these guys, but we still have to give them, but the United States still has to give them money. This is just, it's completely, it's, it's, it's a complete joke. The, the impetus for this is Assad is quickly reclaiming formerly lost ter- territory in Syria, which is motivating the United States to act fast to support the rebels. Right now, they're already supporting the rebels. The CIA is currently providing weapons and training to the rebels, but they think it's not enough. They're fearing it's not enough to make any sort of difference on the battlefield. This, again, is been reported by foreign policy. Now, all of these, these extremists, the, gov- the U.S. government has been funding all these extremists since the 1970s and probably before. Uh, it's come out, it's common knowledge that J- Jimmy Carter and Zbigniew Brzezinski helped fund the Mujahideen, which a lot of members from the Mujahideen then became into Iraq later, or Iraq Al Qaeda later, but they funded the Mujahideen to use as a blunt tool against the Soviets. <laughs> they used them to fight the Soviets and get them out of Afghanistan and basically use them as proxies against the Soviets. Now, <clears throat> it has now emerged that Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, he was definitely he was definitely definitely trained by the by with the help of the United States. Now, the think about this. This guy is the big bad guy that we're all supposed to be scared of that he's he's going to commit or he's going to organize and commit terror attacks in the West, but he was trained by the United States. Come on. This is utterly ridiculous. There, John McCain had like t- has had pictures taken with the Syrian rebels. Uh, he's, he called them heroes. He, he's just he's just a warmonger, disgusting human being. John McCain is a disgusting, vile piece of trash. And then I said, as I spoke of a little earlier, there the Foreign Affairs magazine is tr- is trembling in their boots, using saying that the United States or Europe, is going to face a terror attack by ISIS. They're call, they call ISIS a aggressive, expansionist organization and possesses a real danger. It might be focusing most of its attentions on Iraq for now, but its long-term ambitions are much, much wider. Well, then why should we fund them? Why are you why is the United States playing these foreign policy adventures which end in the deaths of of thousands of people, millions of people and trains the boogeyman and ends up training the boogeyman that we're all supposed to be scared of. The, what's interesting this article lists numerous examples of attacks that were committed by groups which came together to form ISIS. Again, ISIS is the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. The article claims that these are not the actions of a locally focused group, but of a group that is looking to establish a base from which to expand its influence worldwide. The European Union's counterterrorism coordinator said that it is very likely that ISIS maybe is preparing, training, and directing some of the foreign fighters to mount attacks in Europe. Now, <clears throat> we all know that through the that Europe has become a lot through its multicultural policies has opened the doors to a lot of these people in the Middle East. And you know that's fine. I don't have a problem with people moving with transportation, but it's interesting. It's really what's interesting about the the immigration policy of Western nations is if you want to move from one Western nation to another, it's a headache. If you want to move to uh, from here to the UK or UK to here to Canada, it's it's a headache. You know, they there's so many standards you have to, so many hoops you have to jump through, so many standards you have to meet. It's almost impossible for someone who is a regular person 
without a university degree just to go over there and work or come here and work. <clears throat> but if you live in a, a third world nation, if you world live in a, a war-torn nation like, like Afghanistan and Iraq and are potentially a some sort of terrorist or extremists, it's a lot easier. You can just claim refugee status and you can and the, they roll out the red carpet for you. So it really seems like they are they're encouraging this. They want people from these nations to to mo- move in. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe they want terrorists to come to move in so they can expand so they can use that the pretext of terrorism as an excuse to scare the living daylights out of people and expand their scope and power. <clears throat> British Prime Minister David Cameron has warned that beyond just expanding their ter- ter- territory in the Middle East, ISIS are planning to attack the UK. Well, again, if, if these Muslim extremists are so bad, if they're so, if they're going to get us, if we have to be afraid of them, then number one, why are you sending them money? Why is the West continually sending these people money? It doesn't make sense. Stop sending them tax money. If you get, you don't, you don't even have your narrative straight. You don't even have your, you don't have anything straight. You don't even have your your whole worldview straight. You you can say that we have to be scared of them and they're bad, but then you're funding them. You can't have it both ways. It's one or the other. They're either bad, scary people, or we need to fund them to fund. It's it's you can't have it both ways to fund them to fight uh, Assad, which uh, is supposedly a, is a, a, Assad just a regime that's friendly to Russia that the West doesn't like. But they they list some examples of jihadist groups of jihadist attacks in the West, specifically in Europe. In two thousand seven, uh, jihadists attempted a car bombing in Glasgow in the UK. A British doctor who carried out the attack had the names and numbers of members of the Islamic State of Iraq. The Islamic State of Iraq is a precursor, is a predecessor to the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. It's just a another, excuse me, another organization that was merged into what we know now, what we now know as ISIS. Now this doctor was actually found guilty of his of this attack. No, what's interesting and in, in all the in most of these these attacks, this article lists there were no fatalities. <clears throat> now this <clears throat> these jihadists attempt to run a car into the Glasgow airport. I guess it got stuck in the doorway. Had some bombs on it. The bombs didn't go off, and one of the accomp- doctor's accomplices end up di- ended up dying. Uh, but n- other than that, there were no fatalities. In 2010, an operative from an organization, again the Islamic State of Iraq, which again was a predecessor to ISIS, attempted a failed suicide bombing in Stockholm, Sweden. He had a bunch of pipe bombs, and they didn't go off. The the only one he only one that went off was the one that ended up killing him now it makes me wonder it makes me wonder because we all know the ties between these intelligence groups and these and these so-called Mossad or excuse me these so-called islamists these islamic extremists i you know we all know the history of the west of of Police agencies handing over dud bombs and setting up patsies. Now it makes me wonder if these sorts of attacks are actually s- genuine or if they're staged to keep the fear of terrorism alive. Now they can't pull another 9/11. They can't pull another big, big explosion, big uh, attack because I think. They know deep down in their hearts that the the specter of false flag terrorism has been exposed. T- people know that governments stage false flag terror attacks, and they're instinctively people are instinctively skeptical of the narratives when a, a large scale terrorist attack does happen, and a lot of people will go into 
the details and trying to see if these if this attack is indeed genuine if these attacks are genuine and happened as the happened the way the official stories are told so that is why i think these like i don't know i don't know specifically about these attacks just the fact that both of them all of the attacks mentioned in this article no 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 one no one died except the perpetrators they none of them were successful which makes me inherently skeptical so what happened i don't know but it just makes me wonder if these are if these were patsies who were given dud bombs and set up to fail last month a member of isis Okay, I was wrong. There was some that there are some genuine attacks where other people died. Uh, yes, last month a member of ISIS from uh, from France shot up a, muse- a Jewish museum in Brussels, according to local police. His police his uh, his flag excuse me his gun was wrapped in the flag of ISIS or the ISIS flag. Now, there's one thing I want to stress to you folks. I mean, th- pay attention because this is important. If there is ever ever another large-scale 9-11 style terrorist attack com- and we are told it is committed by Islamic extremists <clears throat> remember that the US government along with Israel and the UK supported these guys remember that John McCain took pictures with these guys remember that Barack Obama wanted to send f- 500 million dollars to these rebels in Syria, to these Islamicists, to these religious extremists that we're told are going to come get us all in our sleep, but yet we still let them into our countries by the boat full. By the boat full. They're either dangerous or they're not. If they're dangerous, stop. we need to stop cutting them in our countries. Like, I'm an ANCAP. I'm not against immigration, but the state needs to keep its story straight. The state needs to keep its goddamn story straight. You, you can't have it both ways. You can't you ha- can't have the government bringing boatfuls of people into our into Western nations, and then at the same time telling us that we have to be afraid because there's a contradiction there. There's a contradiction there, okay? And I'm not stupid enough to fall for it. And I'm getting most of the, no one watching this is not stupid enough to fall for it. So just we just have to be mindful of the contradictions that the powers that be, the state. Enforcers, the the tyrants, the oligarchs, try and tell us because they're they're not. I don't even think they're that bright. They think they're the elite super race, but they seem fucking stupid to me. This is just, this is basic basic one hundred and one. If I was gonna if I was gonna if I was gonna do this do the shit that they did. If I was gonna create false flag terror. If I was gonna rule a society, I would at least try and have some logical parameters that my narratives would be run by. So remember that John McCain took pictures of these assholes, pictures with these assholes. Remember that he went to Washington and lobbied the U.S. government to support the Syrian rebels. Remember that these guys are ISIS and that the U.S. government sent them money, supplies, and training for years. (sighs) All right, our next story. The Alberta government kidnaps and murders children. Sound like a sensationalistic headline? Well, it's pretty much true. Since 1999, 145 children died while under the protection, the protection of the social services here in Alberta. That's just in Alberta. But only, here's the kicker, of the 145 kids that died, only 56 of these deaths were reported in the government's annual reports. One, one case, a four-and-a-half-year-old uh, Delona Sullivan died in 2011, just days after she was taken into care. Care, right? Fuck. According to their grandmother, and this was reported by the CBC, through the autopsy report, there was four different drugs in her system. She had diarrhea for a week, and we had said the, to the foster person that was caring for her that she had been seen by a doctor now. And 
just and she just said if she wasn't better by Monday, she would take her to another appointment. Well, Monday, she laid her head down at 10:30 in the morning and never bothered checking her checking on her till 3:30 in the afternoon. Dude, that's like that's ridiculous. That is like that's ridiculous. 5 hours, you know. This this just fucking boils my blood. We're going to take you're going to support the government that steals people's fucking kids and then brings and then kills them? Oh yeah, cuz we need the state. Without the without government, who would steal and murder the children? It's ridiculous. These people are not they're not capable to run. They're not capable to run the economy. They're not capable to look after children. They're not capable to do anything. They cause more death and destruction than anyone in the world. But no, what about the government? What about the government? Fuck the government. No, I'm sorry, but like they're they're killing children. This isn't fucking this, and this isn't even happening uh, in some far off land. This is happening in my fucking place, my fucking region. And I still have to put up these status bootlicker motherfucker assholes who are just wide eyed with madness and, and just oh, and defending the government. They're just they're full of Stockholm syndrome. I'm sorry, I'm getting like wound up, but come on, come on. This is just such bullshit. Dave Hancock, who's now the Premier of Alberta, he's the acting premier since Alison Redfraud stepped down. He is the, uh, up until re- till he took on the duties of premier, was the Alberta Minister of Human Services and oversaw the child welfare system. And he, he's an utter failure. He's an utter failure. And, but what happens in, in the status paradigm when you're an absolute failure and you are responsible for the deaths of 100 children? You get promoted. <sighs> the Edmonton and Calgary newspapers fought a four-year court battle to have these records released. They, re- they, ha- they fought a four-year court battle to have, uh, well, I think what ended up being released was like 3,000 pages worth of documents. And it, it was just ridiculous. They, you know, these, the, some of the stories, is, it's utterly ridiculous. They just were, would just die in more than a dozen babies. More than a dozen babies died inexplicably in their sleep. And many more died from preventable sleep-related incidents. These people are utterly just criminal. If it, put it this way, if, if I had my own kid and it died the same way that these kids died in foster care, I would be held responsible. I would be going to court. But because these, these idiot foster, gremlin foster parents who don't give a shit, they're agents of the state, they are not held to any sort of account. It's ridiculous. One died twisted in a foster parent's bed sheets. Another suffocated in a collapsed bassinet. A third succumbed to untreated pneumonia while sleeping on the floor. If I did, if, if we did this, we would be held to jail. If we, we would be held accountable. But no, not the state gremlins, not the state parasites who kill children. It's ridiculous. Only a f- small fraction of these cases were reported. <sighs> the ca- another case, a lady I've been in contact with, I haven't been able to organize an interview with her, but I'm hoping to have her on the show sometime. Uh, Velvet Martin, Martin, her daughter Samantha was diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder shortly after she was born in 1993. They were told by the state that as the natural family, government health care, basically, government health care would not be available to their child and to achieve access that they must hand over their guardianship of their child, their legal parental rights to the state would be, must be relinquished in order for her daughter to be, to be treated and you would have to be relinquished to a medical foster home. While in care of the state, her daughter suffered numerous injuries, including seven broken bones, inefficient treatment for seizures. Her daughter, Samantha, suffered a heart attack at the age of 13 and died December 3rd, 2006. Another fucking victim casualty of the state apparatus 
I don't know what else to say about that. It's fucking disgusting. It's fucking disgusting. Uh, I, I, I'm going to close the story. I have one more story after. It almost seems like uh, kind of like pathetic to kind of go from something else to something as horrific as this. But I'll just leave you with some facts about foster children. Uh, I can, I'll leave the link in the description for the sources. Foster children are seven to eight times more likely to be abused, more likely to end up homeless, with nearly half becoming homeless by the age of 18, three times more likely to, put, to be put on psychotropic drugs, which we know have dangerous side effects. All the, all the school shooters, all the mass shootings were committed by people on psychotropic drugs. Seven times more likely to develop an eating disorder. More likely to have PTSD, that's post-traumatic stress syndrome, than veterans of war, and less, and less likely to recover from it. More likely to have pre teen pregnancies. 20% more likely to... 20% more likely to become arrested, to be arrested by the police or have legal difficulties, and six times more likely to die. You know, I, I kind of freaked out in this story, but come on, man. Like, this is the most basic shit. This is some of the most basic shit. Like, you can't even defend this the system. I'm sorry, but you can't. It's indefensible. It's disgusting. And I just, yeah. Our next story, my last story for tonight... The UN is interfering in the US border crisis. In an update from last from my story last week on the US border crisis, representatives from the United Nations High Commission for Refugees is in according to WorldNet Daily intensely discussing in meetings the possibility of extending UN protection to the thousands of Central Americans crossing the US border with Mexico by defining them as refugees who are seeking asylum from political and domestic violence in their home nations. Well, there you go. The UN is getting involved. I told you that would happen. You know, it's the UN is going to take any and all opportunities to involve itself specifically in the United States cuz if they can get a foot in the door working within the United States, then they will, that's like the ticket. That's their ticket to world government. Because the United States is right now world's only superpower. Yeah, Russia, China, they're rising, but they still aren't anywhere near where the United States is. If the, if the UN can get its foot in the door in the US, working with the government, providing services, doing whatever it can, then that's the ticket for world government, right? If they can get peacekeepers on the ground, if the, they there genuinely is a disarmament and re reclamation uh, program, then, you know, that's done. Then, you know, any other nation, then then they can get in any nation, you know. It's, it's all it is. The UN body concluded that the immigrants coming from the Central America are refugee coming from Central America are refugees deserving international protection under the auspices of the UN as they seek asylum in the US. The minister cited the UN's 30 30 year declaration on the rights of refugees. So yeah, like I said, the United Nations is going to continue to expand. It's going to continue to try and involve itself anywhere it can, specifically in the United States, especially because you, the UN uh, headquarters is in the United States. And yeah, like, I could see the, I could see New York becoming a little city-state of the United Nations. You know, you've got the DDR program, the disarmament, the disarmament program, disarmament and rec reclamation. So it, it's, it's not, it's not a hard it's not a it's not beyond the realm of plausibility you know it's it's quite plausible actually that the UN would would do this you know again it's just another it's just exhibiting the same behaviors as any federal government that is trying to establish itself as a power you know the United States federal government 
didn't didn't uh, at first do all all the sort of it, it put it this way: the United States federal government was very very small in its scope and power when you know the United States was first was first founded. It would it was a really just. All these nations were all these uh, the states. This was called the United States because they were all they're separate states, nations really, that came together under one umbrella, <clears throat> and that a, a union, much like the European Union or the United Nations, and each one was supposedly allowed to leave whenever they chose. Well, you know, when you had the northern the War of Northern Aggression, known as the Civil War, you know that kind of changed. But yeah, so. We know that their U- the UN is looking for DDR dismember- disarmament and demobilization and reintegration officers who would be stationed in New York. So that's that. Well, like I said, we'll see. I will cover this story as it develops, as well as the other stories I covered tonight. All right. Well, I'm Richard Heathen. Thank you for watching.